Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. And welcome to tonight's clinical webcast, The Whole Equation, Perimetry and Easy to Read Printouts by Dr. Michael Chiglasium. My name is Carver. I am a clinical application specialist here at Oculus. You have a text box on your GoToWebinar screen where you can enter in questions. Enter in your questions at any time, and uh, we'll discuss them both at the middle and the end of tonight's webcast. So really go ahead and get those in early. Dr. Chiglasian is an associate professor at the Illinois College of Optometry and chief of staff of the Illinois Eye Institute. He is a graduate of the State University of New York College of Optometry and completed a residency in primary eye care and ocular disease at the Pennsylvania College of Optometry. He is a founding member and currently the executive vice president of the Optometric Glaucoma Society. Uh, Dr. Chiglasian's clinical practice is focused exclusively on patients with glaucoma and related conditions and while co-managing surgical care as well. His research interests include perimetry and OCT technology, particularly in the collection of reference databases. Dr. Duglazian, I'm very excited for your presentation tonight. Take it away. Thank you, Carver. Uh, welcome, everyone. It is a pleasure to be with you uh, here this evening, uh, wherever you are, um, across the country, I hope. Um, this is the second of my presentations uh, working with Oculus in discussing the easy field perimeter. And today we're going to be taking a deeper dive uh, than I did last time, focusing in on how to read and interpret the printouts. Not that anyone is really printing out paper anymore, at least I don't think many people are, but the reports that go along with your easy field perimeter um, are uh, you know, necessary to be interpreted. Uh, documented in your electronic health record, and I'm going to show you tips and pearls on how to make that easy. So uh, for the next uh, 40, 45 minutes or so, that's what we're going to be doing. Uh, we welcome your questions uh, in the chat, and uh, I'll take some breaks to, to accommodate them if they are there. Okay. Uh, so just by way of introduction, you know, we're talking about automated uh, perimetry here. Um, it continues to progress and improve. Um, there are uh, always new nuances to the technology by all companies, including Oculus, uh, to uh, make visual field testing easier and more accurate for our patients. Uh, while we focus a lot on our OCT devices and OCT imaging, uh, we should all know that visual field testing remains a required part of uh, disease evaluation and management, obviously particularly for glaucoma. And I, I think I'll make the case for you here this evening that you know having a perimeter and a fundus camera, if you don't happen to have an OCT in your office, uh, can get you know a good portion of the job done for many of your glaucoma suspects. Uh, of course, there will be times when patients have to be referred for OCT imaging and whatnot. But, you know, having your perimeter, knowing how to use it correctly, knowing how to interpret the report is really what is essential. And that's what I'd like to focus on, on here this evening. So we test the visual field for many reasons. As I've said already, we're going to focus in on, you know, probably the number one um, medical diagnosis that we use to test the visual field, which is glaucoma. But uh, we want our devices to uh, work for us in many different conditions. So, you know, all types of neurological conditions, uh, toxicities from uh, medications like Plaquenil, uh, you know, patients with patient with a history of headaches, you know, potentially patients with space occupying lesions and, you know, other neurological conditions uh, can often be reflected in the visual field. Patients who've had a stroke and, and whatnot, all of those need to be documented so that we have a better understanding of the patient's visual function. Uh, that in, that then directs our uh, visual and or medical management of those patients. And it really is a, a guide to helping the patients be more successful in their daily activities if they have some sort of visual impairment. So that's a lot to ask for a single device. Uh, we want the, our visual field uh, devices to do this uh, quickly, efficiently, um, and, and as at least cost possible, at least stress possible to our patients. And so, uh, you know, let's take a look at uh, what we can do with the easy field. Uh, specifically for glaucoma, you know, we're measuring 
uh, not just the, we are, in fact, we're not measuring at all the limits of the visual field. That's the outside extent of the visual field. We really care about what's going on inside the central portion of the visual field, where the scotomas or the defects begin to develop due to loss of uh, retinal ganglion cell axons in response to the glaucomatous disease process. And so that's what we're trying to characterize. And we need our device to do it in a as I said, a fast and efficient manner so that we can uh, associate the type of abnormality that is seen on our printout or report and classify it as, as being glaucomatous or as being non-glaucomatous, maybe due to some other disease or perhaps just an artifact of poor testing. Uh, obviously, our visual field testing is a subjective uh, type of test that our patient has to perform uh, accurately and reliably on. And uh, again, that's another um, a stress on the device that we ask that it uh, uh, work quickly and efficiently for our patients. So let's take a look at glaucoma. Um, and just, you know, in this schematic here, as we go around the circle from developing glaucoma disease, uh, this then affects the optic nerve. Uh, this is an anterior chiasmal lesion, so it's only going to affect nerve fibers in one eye. You're not going to get a, a hemianopic type of lesion that you would get from a, uh, a disturbance in the uh, primary visual cortex. Uh, but, you know, how do we evaluate that? Do we do confrontation fields? Do we do a screening field? Uh, ultimately, does that get, to, get us to our grayscale reports and our um, uh, perhaps threshold testing to quantify the size, shape, and depth of that defect more accurately. Um, so that's, uh, that's the challenge for our devices here. Um, I do like to remind everyone that, you know, what we may think of as glaucoma vision loss or visual field loss, um, you know, is still mixed up in a lot of, uh, of folklore almost because uh, patients do not experience a tunnel of vision until the very end stages of the disease. And even then, they don't really um, experience that. Um, it's more a blurring of their vision, uh, certainly a dimming of vision at a certain point in time. But the traditional thinking of uh, the patient's field is constricted in a tunnel-like area, as you see in the upper right-hand corner there, is not really uh, classically seen by patients. What they may or may not notice are these black parts or scotomas to their vision. But more likely, those are not even noticed by the patient because the fellow eye and the brain are filling those in. So that the patient has very little impact on their vision loss in the, you know, for the vast part of the early to moderate stages of the disease of glaucoma. Hence, it's really important that our perimeter under the appropriate testing conditions uh, identify these defects in the visual field that our patients can't report to us. We're certainly not going to be able to identify with a confrontation visual field. And then that allows us to make the diagnosis. And it, of course, allows us to track the disease over time. So another question that comes up is, um, why just test the central 30 degrees? Or if you see new modern perimeters, uh, you know, most of the companies have scaled down the devices so that only the central 30 degrees is being tested. And back in the day, you may remember, we used to think that we needed to test out to 60 degrees or 90 or 100 degrees on the temporal side of the visual field. And, you know, our perimeters, our large bowl perimeters were able to do that. A Goldman perimeter, uh, some of the original bowl perimeter perimetry devices uh, from uh, Octopus and Humphrey were able to do that. But these days, we are all, um, as, as specialists here, uh, comfortable with just confining our testing, testing to the central 30 degrees. That represents 66% of the ganglion cells and 83% of the visual cortex. Basically, that means that basically all optic nerve pathologies and early development of field loss associated with those pathologies can be found within the central 30 degrees. But you do have to know how to do the testing and what type of testing parameters you should utilize. So uh, point of this slide, don't worry about not being able to test outside the central 30 degrees for the vast majority of your medical necessity of 
documenting field loss due to glaucoma and other diseases. Now, there may be other reasons and needs why you may need to have uh, capabilities to test the extended visual field for functional assessment, as I've alluded to already. But for a medical standpoint, not really necessary to make a diagnosis nor to manage the patient over time. In fact, if you look at this slide here, uh, where I've put a uh, photograph of a patient with a retinal nerve fiber layer dropout or loss infrotemporally. There's actually a, even a little notch to the neuroretinal rim on the optic disc photograph there. Um, that corresponds to uh, an OCT scan that we've taken in the macular region. This is our ganglion cell analysis. Some people refer to it as the ganglion cell complex. Um, it's a modified macular scan uh, concentrating on the ganglion cells that may, that are the cell bodies for the retinal uh, nerve fiber layer axons. And so there's damage on the photograph, damage on the OCT, and the field defect that we get on this uh, report from, uh, from the field instrument is for a very central, and I use the term split fixation, uh, central field defect. So split fixation means that it is splitting or crossing over the vertical midline while these black boxes and on the grayscale are resting on the horizontal midline. So this is just an example of a patient with a very central field defect in glaucoma uh, necessitating our uh, choosing tests from our perimeter appropriately and accurately now that we know that this is um, a part of the disease process. 25 years ago, we were not so well aware of that. So our practice patterns have changed. In fact, I'm sure many of you are, are well aware that incorporating a 10-2 pattern grid into the testing for uh, glaucoma suspects has really become uh, a standard of care now. Work from Don Hood and, uh, and others have really documented and identified the importance of doing this. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this in another section. I'm just outlining for you here the need for um, focused central testing and that the Oculus Easy Field can get this all done for us. We have these test pattern options for us um, built into the Easy Field device. Um, as a corollary to that, a recent publication in the Journal of Glaucoma by uh, Michael Sullivan, me, an optometrist uh, in New Mexico, and I believe uh, moving to New York shortly, um, does some wonderful uh, studies and investigations and has uh, evaluated 10-2s and, and visual fields for quite a while. And this recent publication identified that when you are looking for something to help predict which patients are going to progress on their visual field, a patient with a 10-2 visual field defect is a high likelihood uh, to progress and get worse over time without more aggressive intervention, i.e. lowering of the intraocular pressure. So again, 24-2s uh, really rule the day in visual field testing for glaucoma. 10-2s are essential, essential as well. Uh, all of this is confined within the central 30 degrees. And from the entire spectrum of types of field defects that we see in glaucoma, here's just a, a slide reiterating some of the you know, uh, legacy terms for the uh, shape and location of a defect in the visual field. Um, these are the terms that we are uh, using to describe that. Arcuate scotomas up at the top here, uh, nasal steps, and uh, some of these paracentral scotomas, those are really the three things that I look for in my patients with glaucoma. Nasal steps being a little bit further out, anything in this arcuate region is curving back and leading back to the blind spot. It's you know often within uh, 20 degrees. So again, we don't need anything in the peripheral field. And sometimes within that, you'll see paracentral scotomas. Sometimes you'll see things very central Again, they respect the horizontal midline because for anatomical reasons, the optic nerve is usually asymmetrically affected with glaucomatous damage, meaning that the, either the inferior portion of the optic nerve neuroretinal rim or the superior portion of optic nerve neuroretinal rim is affected by the disease process, lending and leading to uh, visual field loss in the opposite um, hemifield. So Oculus Easy Field, this is the device we're talking about this evening. 
Um, it's a device I've been using for many months now, and I incorporate it uh, into my regular patient care. Of course, I do have other devices here. So, uh, you know, full disclosure, I have three or four different types of OCT. I have three or four different types of perimeters. I'm always uh, investigating um, and using things and finding, um, you know, the optimal qualities and the optimal ways to use each of these devices. Um, and I'm going to go over some tips and pearls for you to use your Oculus Easy Field, as well as show you how to interpret the uh, report uh, that you get after completing the test. You know, I, I probably can't do a visual field type lecture without at least acknowledging that, you know, uh, currently available and um, becoming more uh, available are these head mounted or headset devices, sometimes called VR for virtual reality uh, perimetry devices. There are several of them, many of them out on the marketplace now, uh, really with not too much in way of publications and validation for their accuracy. Uh, some of them seem to be, you know, fairly good, um, but still have limitations. And so I would just caution everyone to say that, you know, we're not uh, at yet at this point in time in 2023 in the realm of, you know, we're going to be throwing away our tabletop devices for visual field testing. Um, it is just, you know, we have 30 plus, uh, probably closer to 40 years of development of tabletop white-on-white uh, -white visual field testing devices by Oculus, by Octopus, by Humphrey, and by, by Topcon, by many others. Um, so that may change in the future, and we may be using more of these headset devices. Right now, they're an adjunct. They're perhaps a, a nice thing to have for some situations. Personally, uh, I don't see them replacing my uh, tabletop devices anytime in the near future. Again, uh, I'm sure improvements will come with them and things may change uh, at some point in time. But as for right now, uh, I think the best choice and selection for a uh, eye care practitioners who is seeing patients and they need to screen for disease or uh, do threshold testing for uh, further eval evaluation of glaucoma disease is a uh, ergonomic uh, tabletop device that has all the right bells and whistles and meets the needs of the of the practice. So let's move forward and talk about uh, some of the processes of selecting which test you're going to do because there are a number of testing options. So part of the other problem with perimetry um, in its, you know, not just 40 years of automated perimetry with uh, computerized devices and, you know, um, more like 80 or 90 years of manual testing uh, is that there's many different ways to test and measure the visual field and different investigators and different uh, instrument companies will come up with different strategies and um, we're, they're always trying to optimize it. Uh, primarily to the point of saving test time, of course, and maintaining the same level of sensitivity. So again, the, there are many different testing strategies that you can select from on your easy field. Uh, quite frankly, they're very similar and analogous to what you will find on other testing devices. They just have different names. So there are screening options, a, a very short 20-point screening test option. There's a, a 24 a dash two grid screening option that I, I use somewhat. Um, actually, I don't use too much screening testing options at all for my patients. I know that some, pa some practices are geared that way and that works well for their uh, workflow and practice management flow. And it's perhaps a, a certainly a much better alternative than doing a confrontation field is to do a screening field. Um, my practice is more medical and I'm much more likely to have a high index of suspicion for disease and thus I'm going to go straight to a threshold test. So on the Oculus uh, Easy field, that is going to be the 24-2 uh, fast threshold or uh, if it's an option available on your instrument, there is also the Spark Precision um, uh, threshold testing program that is a faster and a little bit shorter and uh, a test that I like a lot and use a lot. But if you don't have the Spark test, uh, the 24-2 fast, fast threshold is, uh, again, akin to many of the other testing strategies available from other um, perimetry companies. And then, of course, uh, we've talked about the 10-2. That is available as well. So, you know, any practitioner wants to make sure that their uh, technicians 
uh, in the office are familiar uh, with what the protocol is. Um, perhaps it's a screening on everybody who comes in for a routine eye exam or comprehensive uh, yearly eye exam. Perhaps it's a threshold test on patients who have higher risk of uh, disease. Perhaps it's someone who uh, does a screening test and uh, fails on many points. And the appropriate thing to do is either consider to repeat the screening test a second time and see if they um, appear in the same location, which gives them uh, you know, the reliability and consistency. Uh, and then if they are there on a screening field, they should be uh, reevaluated on a threshold field if you're going to continue to manage that patient in the office. So that's uh, sort of the building blocks of uh, deciding which tests to do. Um, here's just a, uh, a display pattern from the easy field for a 24-2 screening test. Uh, this takes, you know, somewhere between 60 and 80 seconds per eye, depending on whether or not there are any uh, abnormalities um, from the patient or any defects. Here, these are two normal uh, uh, tests. You can look at this really quickly. Uh, perhaps there's a way to get the report into your EHR to go over and look at it on the computer screen, the laptop screen that comes along with the easy field. Lots of different ways to uh, get these test results and you have to figure out the workflow and um, image management, so to speak, in your office. You, you may be printing out a paper report, although I don't really see too many practices doing that anymore. So here's what your 24-2 report might look like. Um, here I've circled some of the, you know, abnormal uh, test locations where the patient, you know, did not fall within the normative database. So there's a black square there. Their uh, sensitivity at those locations is well below what it should be. Um, you have to decide, you know, are these three points, a cluster of three points in the nasal region for this right eye? Is that an early defect from glaucoma? You know, this uh, isolated uh, point over here might be part of an arcuate band of loss here. Um, you're really going to need to follow this screening 24-2 field up with a threshold test. Um, maybe not on the same day, uh, maybe not in your office, depending on uh, the amount of disease management that you're doing, but you found something here and that needs to be attended to and reported on and identified. So, um, you know, there's, we're going to take a, a closer look at the in report interpretation for the top part when we look at our threshold tests. Um, so I've given some of the pros and cons um, for the screening tests. Again, screening tests work well in some practice locations uh, where you have patients who can do it quickly. The vast majority of the tests are going to be all normal without any um, defect or um, abnormalities. But if you have an older patient population or a more heavily disease-ridden patient population, that's when screening tests, in my opinion, can really bog things down and um, you may want to consider a different approach to deciding when you're going to evaluate the visual field, um, what the markers are, is it following the clinical exam uh, based on other risk factors, and if you choose to do a test, you might choose to go straight to uh, one of the threshold tests. Of course, a fast threshold test is going to save you a lot of time as compared to the traditional uh, thresholding algorithms that you know, sometimes took uh, 10 or 15 minutes per eye. So speeding it up as um, uh, all the uh, parametric companies have done is really an essential program to avail yourself of. And we'll get into uh, looking at that report in just a little bit. Uh, I did mention the optional uh, Spark uh, program if that's available on your instrument or uh, you may want to look into an upgrade for that. Uh, Spark is a, a proprietary uh, testing algorithm. Uh, it's basically a, a very fast test, and I won't go through how it's done here, but it's been well validated in the literature, um, and it pr proceeds through the test in segments, and based on um, um, uh, representative locations, it allows it to proceed very quickly and very efficiently. And, and from what I've seen, give me very accurate results in about three minutes or a little over three minutes for just about all eyes. So it's really quite a remarkable program and is even faster in, uh, in terms of test time as compared to the fast threshold. So there again is the testing grid for the uh, Spark 
um, options, and there are a couple of different Spark options that I'm not going to get into here. Um, you can sort of think of this as being analogous to a top strategy or a CETA strategy or you know whatever uh, other fast strategies are out there. Um, as I said, it's predictable, it's repeatable, um, and it can be incorporated into progression analysis. So that's key if you are following your patients over time for glaucoma disease. And here's an example of a uh, spark precision test on a, a low risk glaucoma suspect that I saw recently. Um, this is a normal test result. You know, you might look really closely and we'll get into this in a little bit. There's always a couple of little abnormal test points that will you know, be, be flagged on the uh, test. But here we completed the test on this right eye in three minutes and 14 seconds. And so uh, we were very quickly and ably, uh, very quickly uh, able to determine that the field here is normal for the patient. And then I can proceed with the rest of my investigation uh, if I need to look at the OCT or IOP or family history or whatever else is going on for the patient. As I said, um, Spark is not something that is just uh, made up by Oculus. It's been uh, well validated in the literature. And so here are just two uh, recent reports. Um, uh, documenting its e effectivity and efficacy and accuracy as compared to the um, more widely known, sure, at least in North America, uh, the CETA algorithm. But again, if you don't have uh, Spark, then fast, fast threshold is, is a perfectly fine way to go. You'll find a little bit more test time on each eye, uh, but it's really uh, nothing like it used to be with the old thresholding, uh, full thresholding algorithms. Let's also talk about uh, selecting a test pattern. Uh, we, again, identified this a little bit early on in the introduction. Uh, here are two examples from another perimeter for the 24-2 grid on the left-hand side and the 10-2 grid on the right-hand side. Uh, again, as you know now, it's really important to have both of these testing grids on the vast majority of your glaucoma suspects. Um, that's really, you know, uh, I don't know if it's a standard of care or anything medical legally like that, but it is still, it is quite common to do that. Um, it is more testing for our patient, and this, thus that's why we want to speed up our test time, shorten the duration of the test, maintain the same accuracy, and allow us to do uh, 24, I usually do 24-2 tests on one day, and then a couple months later I'll, I'll do a 10-2, and then I'll go back alternating uh, back and forth between those two. And you know, uh, for my suspects and high-risk suspects. If I find something, then uh, you know, I might need to follow it up a, a little bit more closely and frequently. But these options, 24-2 uh, and 10-2 grid, are available on your easy field. Here's the, the Spark Precision selection that I've made here uh, from my device. And it has this you know, standard grid layout of the 24-2. And if you uh, uh, want to on, you know, potentially on the same day, although, although I don't recommend it, uh, the Macular 10-2 program is in there as well. And so you can identify those uh, potentially uh, early and small uh, visual field defects that can crop up in glaucoma. Um, I think when you see the slide here, uh, it reiterates the need for a 10-2 type of grid pattern. If you display the test locations for the 24-2 grid pattern on the fundus, as you see in this photograph here, you'll see that there is not too many. In fact, there's only about a 16 out of 20 out of 54 test locations in the central 20 degrees and only four of them in the central 10 degrees inside that red circle. So that's where 50% of our ganglion cells are. That's where glaucoma damage is gonna take place. We need more test locations in that central 20 degrees. And that's what the 10-2 grid is all about. Um, anatomically, if you're thinking about why is this happening, again, just, you know, Don Hood and, uh, and his lab have been able to identify that this inferior, although it happens superiorly as well, but this inferior temporal region um, on uh, coming off the uh, neuroretinal rim is a highly vulnerable uh, uh, zone for damage in the glaucomatous process. So when you damage the axons from either high pressure, bending, kinking, and all the other toxic uh, 
um, uh, um, toxic changes that occur within the retinal ganglion cell axon in glaucoma. Uh, that leads to damage in this region, and that leads to damage centrally on the visual field. So as I put together on this slide here, uh, you know, depending on you know what point you come into the picture, take a look at the optic nerve head picture and look at the neuroretinal rim and the loss of retinal nerve fiber layer tissue just outside of it, or find it with your OCT in this blue wedge defect, find it on your uh, uh, clock hour or pie chart here with the inferior region being flagged for being thinner than the superior temporal and nasal regions. Use your macular ganglion cell complex scan. And then, uh, and on this case, uh, admittedly it was just with the 24-2, we found a single test point right near fixation. And of course the right thing and correct thing to do for this patient is to follow that up with a 10-2 grid so you can better quantify that loss. So that's, you know, putting the whole picture together. Um, uh, but even if you don't have the OCT part, uh, if you have a fundus camera, perhaps, you know, a lot of practices these days have wide field fundus photography, whether it's an Optos and Aiden, um, uh, Aiden camera uh, from Centerview or other devices that are out there. You know, you match a, a good quality photograph. You might want to zoom in on the optic nerve here, and uh, there are tools to do that and look more carefully at the optic uh, nerve head and neuroretinal rim, magnify it, and go for the higher resolution scan around that. Match that with your uh, Oculus Easy Field uh, visual field test. And if your patient is a low risk suspect, you probably don't need much of any other testing. Uh, while certainly OCT is, um, you know, pretty much a standard for uh, high-risk suspects and patients with glaucoma, um, you know, I think there's a there's some room for low-risk suspects who you're just, you know, documenting that, you know, there's no disease present there. I don't see high pressure. I don't see a strong family history. Um, you know, there, there's some room in there for just field testing and photographic testing. Certainly OCT uh, can be very helpful and I'm not dismissing that in any way, but I'm trying to give some latitude for uh, using these two technologies, uh, photography and visual fields in the evaluation of, of low, low risk suspects. Okay, uh, a couple of uh, helpful tips I think for using the easy field. Um, you know, it's uh, all about getting good data and information out of your patient. So if you don't take the time to uh, train your technician, uh, I, and I really I'll say first train yourself so that you know how to train your technician and the staff in your office and guide them on how to get a good visual field test, then you're just going to get bad test results. Whether you have, um, you know, uh, a, a, a any perimetry device, you know, no matter what the cost or size is, um, it's going to be garbage in and garbage out. So know the device, know how it, uh, how the patient needs to be positioned, um, make sure that they are aligned properly, give them the appropriate instructions, um, set them up appropriately in the room, and um, if necessary, give them a demo test, and make sure they understand the test so that they can give you good test results back. Uh, it's not. It's very easy to, you know, adjust the both the cone adjust here as well as the chin rest. If you have the Easy Field C model uh, that has a chin rest, and there's some pros and cons with that. I'll talk about that in a second. But if you have the chin rest and adjust the cone um, while your technician is watching on the laptop display, they will have a video monitor. Uh, here you can see that the eye is not in uh, correct position. You want to have the eye centered in that box there. If you don't have it well centered and they're not looking straight ahead and they're not attending to the fixation target inside the bowl, then you're just going to get bad results no matter what test program you choose, whether it's screening, spark, or full threshold, or 10-2. So take the time to get everything uh, set up correctly and you'll get much better results and you'll spend less time trying to identify, gee, I see all these weird abnormal black areas on my uh, report or printout. What am I supposed to do with that? Well, maybe it was just a bad test by the patient. So get it set up correctly. 
Um, here's another uh, note about, you know, making sure the patient is well centered and well aligned. Um, there's even a little option in the easy field to make sure that they can see a, a ring of uh, white flashing points so that they are well centered into the cone. You know, the patients typically have to look down a little bit. So again, uh, making sure the height of the table and the height of their chair is really critical. There's a four red light fixation target inside there so that should be um you know in the patient's main focus and then they need to be aware of the lights flashing on and off out to the side of course uh inserting the right corrective lens is important so uh there are uh programs built into the software to guide you for that um and it's generally best to use these uh, uh trial lenses as opposed to the patient's uh, glasses um one other issue comes up is uh, whether or not the patient needs to be patched. Uh, there are these shields on the side of the device that for some, maybe 50% maybe of the patients in my experience work pretty well to avoid having to put a patch on the eye. But sometimes, especially with some of my older patients, I find that the having both eyes open uh, leads to a little bit of rivalry between the right and left eye, and they often will not respond as easily or, and sometimes I'll say it's not as comfortable. So I still will frequently use one of these paper patches um, over the eye while I'm using my easy field. Um, I certainly do it on my other uh, bowl perimetry devices. Um, I do have some patients who do okay without a patch, but um, I, I sort of feel like, well, let's just put it on there. I know I'm gonna get, get a good result with it. Um, to each practice is to figure out what is best for their own workflow and, and what their own uh, results are. So I'll leave that up for discussion. Um, and then uh, one other uh, key point is that there is a foveal threshold um, uh, uh, testing that begins at the start of the program. And if your patient isn't clued into this, and looking into the center of the four uh, four red dots that are the fixation target, the X is not in there. But in the middle of those four red dots is um, the initial uh, light stimuli that are being presented to get the foveal threshold. This is uh, helping the perimeter identify what the quote unquote hill of vision is. That's the over patient's overall visual field. And uh, if it's in the right normative range, you're good to go. If it's well below, you may want to repeat it and make sure your patient understands the instructions and is looking in the right place. Because if this value is off, the rest of the test may be off or it will take a long time to get it back on track. So just as a reminder, keep the foveal threshold um, uh, reminder for your patients at the beginning of the test. The uh, FAST threshold report or printout looks like this. It has patient demographics, patient information, the test name, reliability indices, all of this information up here. To me, it's a little bit cluttered and a little bit busy. Um, there's only a little bit of it that's really important, and I'll show you that in an upcoming slide. Uh, this, of course, is the grayscale. This is the decibel plot. And the two key plots that you need are these deviation plots down below here. The deviation uh, or total deviation plot here on the left side and the corrected deviation plot here. We're gonna focus in on those. And then over here are more uh, uh, visual field indices and the glaucoma asymmetry test. Uh, and then a couple other options here that I think are, are probably not so necessary. So while this printout may look a little bit busy to you, um, it really should be familiar to everyone because virtually every perimeter out there has something that is modeled after this from uh, all the major companies. You've got the information for your patient at the top, you've got grayscale, decibel, and they may have different names. Uh, on the Humphrey device, it's called total deviation and pattern deviation. On the easy field, it's called deviation and corrected deviation. So um, they're just you know, changing the name a little bit, but it's basically the same thing, same layout. And so if you're familiar with how to do this, you're gonna know how to do this. And if you're not, then I'm gonna show you in the next five or six slides. So here's the top half of the Easy Field 24-2 uh, Fast Threshold Report. Um, again, a lot of the information here, stimulus uh, size and color, pupil, 
not too important. Date of the exam, yes. Time of day, maybe. Age of patient, yes, because we do need to have the patient's correct date of birth uh, entered into the uh, instrument. Um, but other than that, you know, it's the fixation checks, focusing in on the false positives that are the important reliability and to see there. Presented dots, test time, you know, I'll use the test time to gauge how much I think the patient was able to pay attention during the entire course of the test. As that gets up there, you know, over seven or eight minutes, then I'm, you know, likely to think that the patient was probably getting fatigued. Some of this might not be so accurate. Um, and hence, you know, the need for, you know, thinking about shorter testing programs, if that's an option. The uh, foveal threshold value is there. Again, I don't really use that, um, but it is part of the uh, testing strategy that the instrument uses. Here's the bottom half of the uh, report. So again, deviation, corrected deviation. You don't really have to look at these decibel values up here. These are the uh, amount of decibels deviated from normal. Just look for the black boxes down below. And uh, on the deviation, you'll see all the points that are deviated from uh, the normal age corrected value. And on the corrected, you'll see the points that are just related to a localized defect that is typically what we see in glaucoma. So you use both of these together and I'll show you uh, a couple more examples of that. Um, here's a fast threshold 24-2 on a patient with an, uh, a large inferior nasal step, even an arcuate scotoma. I've highlighted uh, on the grayscale. You could look at the dB values there if you wanted to. Um, but it's really these uh, three indices that I think are really important. Uh, the deviation plot showing you that, well, there's not really much of any generalized depression here. So the defect on the deviation and corrected deviation is going to look the same. So that's a localized defect from glaucoma when these black boxes line up. You just have to learn to ignore some of these other isolated scattered points. And then another good test that we're gonna talk about is the glaucoma asymmetry test. That's a really helpful test uh, to tell you when things are outside normal limits as it is here for um, uh, early damaging glaucoma or uh, moderate and late stage glaucoma uh, damage. Here's a less certain example. So this is just, you know, a noisy, you know, not so accurate patient. I don't see any clear delineation uh, on the corrected uh, or a deviation, a deviation plot or the corrected deviation plot. The grayscale is sort of just scattered all over the place. Uh, I'd have to go back and look at the patient, see if there's a cataract there, uh, consider, you know, what was going wrong uh, with the patient? Did they not understand the instructions? Do they have some other retinal disease? Um, but I don't see any clear pattern identified on this example here. You may still get something uh, on the glaucoma asymmetry test or some of these other values, but again, I'm using a lot of the pattern and location on the corrected deviation plot. Here's an example of, again, using uh, the, the deviation and corrected deviation plots. The top example we've seen already, this is for a patient with only a glaucomatous field defect, and it looks similar on the two plots, or a patient with a cataract. This is gonna cause a generalized depression on the uh, deviation plot, the one on the left, and then no defect on the corrected deviation uh, in this case, uh, I used a pattern deviation example, but it's corrected deviation on your Oculus Easy Field. And that's shown here on the next slide. Um, glaucoma only on the left. You can see it on the grayscale for sure, but really it's more accurate to look at the deviation and corrected deviation grid. These points are um, less interpolation and shading there's a lot of inaccuracy that can come with the grayscale. So be very cautious about that. Don't do your interpretation from there. Uh, look to these two scales down here and then look at some of these global indices that we're gonna be talking about. Here's cataract only, you know, uh, so a, a larger uh, widespread, almost uniform generalized depression. And then, you know, it gets filtered out or some people say subtracted out on the corrected deviation plot. And so it's uh, just not as many black boxes there. And that's typically what you see when there's cataract only. If there was a glaucoma defect, you would then see the glaucoma defect as a localized defect within that region. 
Now, there are a couple other things to review uh, as you're looking at the data. Um, so let's take a look at those in, in this uh, region to the right-hand side of the report and the bottom right-hand corner. Um, there are a number of these visual field indices here. Uh, quite frankly, I think the only important one, well, maybe there's two important ones, is the mean deviation and then uh, to a lesser degree is the pattern standard deviation value. Uh, this short-term fluctuation, forget about that, CPSD and the GSS is a staging system for glaucoma. Um, so I know it's a, to me, it's a little bit busy. Uh, just pay attention to the mean deviation. This is our, you know, this is our uh, universal way of staging visual fields and grading visual field loss. When you're at a minus seven or minus eight dBs below normal, you have a pretty significant visual field defect. Um, so that's the mean deviation. We're going to come back and talk about the glaucoma uh, asymmetry test. Uh, oh, here it is. Perfect. So uh, it, again, in this test, what we're doing is we're comparing above and below the horizontal midline. And when there's asymmetry there, that's very characteristic of glaucoma for the anatomical and pathological reasons that I explained to you earlier. So uh, in the top example, the asymmetry in loss of, um, of uh, value for the dBs is um, borderline and not so great between the superior and inferior hemifield. And uh, much more so in the inferior example where, the, where it's um, noted as outside normal limits. And here are the three uh, quantifications that you can get as, as a display of the outcome from the glaucoma asymmetry test. So use that, that's been well documented in uh, the literature and in reports that it is a uh, quite a sensitive metric to help guide you for early and subtle glaucomatous field defect. So use that along with the mean deviation, although keep in mind that a mean deviation value is not gonna be very negative for small focal nasal step types of defects. Only when the defect gets very large to affect enough of the portion of the visual field will that push it more negative, as we see here, to a, a, a negative 5 dBs below, uh, below normal. The less uh, frequently used, to, at least to me, uh, and things I don't really rely on very much, are the uh, defect curve down here. Um, it just is a rank order of the sensitivity. Um, it's available on other perimeters as well. I typically don't find it that helpful. I'll skip it for now. And then the GSS uh, scoring um, has, you know, uh, potentially some value in staging glaucoma, um, but again, it's not widely used. I don't find it to be critical. If you're looking to keep things simple, um, I think you can skip over the, the notation here. And just, you know, go back to making sure that you're familiar with the shape and location, whether it's here, I just based it on the grayscale, but I would encourage you to use your um, deviation and corrected deviation plots to identify the pattern and shape of those defects in glaucoma. Um, as a reminder, the uh, staging of glaucoma based on severity that we use for Medicare coding uh, was uh, developed by the American Glaucoma Society. It has been adopted by CMS and Medicare. And we quantify uh, the stage of glaucoma into mild with no field loss, moderate with field loss in only one hemifield, but not within five degrees of fixation, and then severe stage glaucoma as examples three and four. So if you're coding uh, with ICD-10 codes and you're coding to this severity stage of glaucoma, which is very helpful to do, um, this, is the, this is the basis of that system. And mild glaucoma is damage on the OCT, optic nerve head, retinal nerve fiber layer, and no change to the visual field. Uh, people get uh, confused by that sometimes. They think they have to still wait for a field loss in glaucoma, a uh, field loss to uh, call a patient or identify a patient with glaucoma disease. Uh, and again, back to the anatomy of, you know, how things happen in the back of the eye and then uh, transpose to the visual field. Here's just another example of, you know, change uh, in the superior, superior temporal neural retinal rim and then an inferior field defect uh, found by the uh, easy field. Uh, nasal steps are 
often but not always the first de field defect, and then they can grow in size. Uh, we talked about the classic structure and function. And um, uh, we have just a, a couple few cases here left to reiterate uh, what we're looking at. Um, this is a patient with mild stage glaucoma. Uh, um, maybe even, I, uh, maybe I have that wrong because based on the field loss, I see that's more of a moderate stage. I apologize for that mistake because um, there is a field defect that should uh, absolutely say moderate stage glaucoma not mild, I apologize. Um, there is a little bit of a cataract uh, here, but I still see some glaucoma-like changes superiorly here on the corrected deviation plot. And um, uh, although the glaucoma heavy field test, I'm taking a careful, more careful look here now, it does say within normal limits. So, well, this is the type of back and forth that you need to do sometimes. Um, look at the glaucoma hemifield test. The fact that that's within normal limits, um, I guess because there's defects down here, um, well, there you go. Time to repeat the visual field test and um, uh, take a, a closer look at the patient looking at the other risk factors. Um, here's a patient that was uh, certainly a suspect based on the optic nerve head appearance, uh, large cupping, normal eye pressure, and a, uh, a normal visual field test result. You know, if the pressure is normal in this patient, uh, if you're comfortable following patients with large discs and large cups, and there's no other family history, you might not need an OCT test. That's sort of the, you know, uh, the gray zone of, you know, does everybody need an OCT? Yeah, it's great if you have it, but if there aren't really many other risk factors, um, and the age of the patient is, you know, this is a 25 year old patient, you know, this is a, a patient who isn't unlikely to have glaucoma unless their pressure was in the 30s or 40s. You don't have normal tension glaucoma in your, in, uh, in your second or third decade. So that's how you can guide yourself there. Uh, another example of um, severe stage glaucoma, this defect is within five degrees of fixation. Uh, of course, there is a large cupping and, and thinning to the neuroretinal rim on the optic disc photograph. And here is a, a patient with uh, a severe stage glaucoma and high myopia. You know, always a challenge to get good test results here. I can tell you the OCT was not very helpful here. And, um, uh, you know, functionally, I'm wanting to know how my patient is doing based on the visual field. So uh, we've reached the end of our cases and uh, really at 53 minutes, I think we've reached the end of uh, our time this evening. So I will stop and pause here and uh, wrap things up with any questions from the chat. Perfect, I do have a number of questions for you. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. I uh, feel like I learn a lot every time I get the uh, opportunity to talk to you, Dr. Chiglesia. Alrighty, to get us started, uh, the first question, this is one that I actually get quite a lot, is just 30-2 uh, versus 24-2. I know there's been a lot more of a consensus recently to uh, do with a 24-2, but why is that? Um, I would never, I'll start off by saying, making a bold statement, that's not a bold statement to me, never do a 24-2, uh, sorry, never do a 30-2, I got mixed up. The reason is too many extra test points that take longer time and fatigue and tire the patient. And the outside ring of test points does not contribute to the identification of disease. It's case that, closed. That makes perfect sense. While we're going through the uh, questions that uh, were asked a little bit earlier, uh, this is a great opportunity to remind everyone that you can go ahead and submit your questions now in the text box. Uh, and we'll go ahead and get those answered for you. All right, and the next question that I have is relating to patients that are physically uncomfortable in some way, whether that be kind of muscularly, uh, or in this case, uh, dry eye patients. What do you do uh, for your patient that have severe dry eye and have a bit, bit of a harder time focusing on the test itself? Yeah, well, uh, you know, of course, certainly um, artificial tears help a lot. Um, it's got, it's educating the patient as well. Um, it's taking pauses during the test. They can hold down the uh, response button and the test will pause. So if they feel they need to take a break, they can. 
um, finding the shortest test pattern. Um, that's you know really about it, and getting them into a comfortable ergonomic position. It just takes a little bit more work up front, in my experience, for those patients. You can generally get reasonably good results. I think that is a really good summary. Uh, you know, an uncomfortable patient is going to be a patient that performed poorly in the visual field. Uh, you mentioned avoiding multiple visual fields on the same visit. When would you repeat a visual field or do a second visual field on the same visit? Um, when the patient is physically, mentally up for it, you know, um, depends on, again, the circumstances. You know, some people might be concerned about coding and billing guidelines. You're not going to get paid for the two tests on the same day. Um, but if I have a bad test result and the patient knows that they did a bad test result and they feel comfortable and confident and my office is not backed up and they feel like they can get through the test a second time, then I'll repeat the test a second time. You know, it's, it's certainly more inconvenient for the patient to, have to come back to repeat the test. Um, so I am flexible. It really depends on practice flow. There's no hard and fast rules. Um, if you're using faster test programs, um, many times you can get a second test done on the same day. Perfect. I think that sums it up quite nicely. Uh, patients with severe glaucoma often have poor reliability um, kind of metrics in terms of, okay, um, more fixation losses. Yes. Um, that, at that, what point do you, on severe glaucoma patients, kind of uh, consider it meaningful, uh, given that there are those higher rates of um, uh, fixation errors? Um, you know, it, you have to really judge the information that you're getting from the visual field test. Um, you know, up to minus 20 dBs for the mean deviation, if you see a pattern that is giving you useful information. That if the patient is able to reliably re respond to some portion of the visual field, uh, perhaps for a patient with advanced field loss, you need to move to the 10 2, not for the early stage reasons that I discussed earlier, but for you know, end stage disease reasons where there is only a small central island of vision remaining. Um, so I don't have a firm cutoff. If I if the patient can't do the test, I'll try it once or twice more to see if they can give me better test results on a, on a different day. Remember, at the end stage of glaucoma, OCTs are not helpful. They're way gone. You're, you know, they're, they're at the floor, as we say. So you really need to rely on the visual field to help you manage the disease. Now, if the patient can't physically do it, they just can't physically do it. And again, I'll reiterate that the head-mounted devices are not going to be a savior there for anyone because they are they are not geared for end-stage glaucoma at this point in time. All righty, perfect. We are at the hour and the end of our questions. I just want to thank you one more time, Dr. Scalazian, for a wonderful presentation. Um, and I always learn so much from you. I want to thank everyone in the audience for uh, submitting your questions and for being such a wonderful audience tonight. Thank you all so much for coming. Any final words, Dr. Chiglazian? No, thank you everyone. See you at the next one.